grading and whether or not we should comment about this. Uh, let me be very frank as a public officer and, and the minister in charge of security in the country. Most of the debate that is going on about this, and anyone you hear talking about downgrading, definitely they display some measure of very frustrating ignorance. For example, the IG has got over 13 other units, some of them crack units that he could draw from in providing support to the deputy president's security. When the deputy president moves, for example, to some parts of, of, of the country, if the IG feels that he needs to bring in SOG or QRT or so on, you see people are raising questions. Many of the people who are debating these things, first of all, don't understand the entirety of the formations of the police service. They don't understand the strengths and the capacities that we have and the training and the capacities of all the other formations. So people have just proceeded from a propagandist, easy point of saying you're downgrading the, the security of the, the, the deputy president and so on. We're not looking at the facts as they are. In that layer too that I, I, I have I've used to demonstrate to you that we actually call these in operational terms support services, you know, because the core team that is supposed to protect the deputy president is the presidential escort. This is what is prepared to protect the deputy president. Whether he is driving, walking, flying, what have you, these are the people, it's intact, he's protected. Then support services, the IG has got over 13 units to draw from to provide support services. What tells you that this unit is stronger or weaker than the other one? And over a period of time, given the resources that we have de de deployed, there are other units that actually you do not know of that probably have got stronger and even better capabilities to do certain things. Because uh, let's look at Article uh, 10 of the National Police Service Act. It, it's very clear. The IG shall determine the distribution and deployment of officers in the service. And how does the IG determine? He uses the information that is given. He uses the intelligence that he receives. And from time to time, he will make certain changes. Why are we second-guessing the IG in the decisions that he has made when he has made so many of that decisions, uh, of such decisions in the past on other, on other areas? And we have demonstrated clearly that the deployment in terms of personnel and asset that we have given to protect this office and the holder of this office is very strong. In fact, Mr. Chairman, some small counties in this country, like Viga and, uh, and Nyamira, for example, probably don't have this kind of uh, deployment, and in terms of even assets, as it were, in providing the support that we are providing with this office. So the question of downgrade, and I sorry, would like to Sorry, you, what did you say? I'm saying that the, some, there are some counties that are smaller in, in, in the country, the smaller counties like Viga, for example, probably don't have the strength of deployment and capacities and assets such as we have deployed to protect the holder of this office. So, so, so when, when, when people jump up and say, oh, you know, there's downgrade and so on, in quality and operational terms, you'll have to go into an operation room and listen to the director of operations tell you everything about this before you make that kind of conclusion. I want to state here again categorically, for the record, there has not been any downgrade of the security of the debit president, period. So, so, so this, this banding what's around really, honestly, is, 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 is not fair. Why was this done? I explained to Mr. Chairman. I am willing to discuss that, but I can't discuss it in an open meeting. Because that is that amount of sharing the notes of the National Security Council or the Minister of the Council in an open meeting like this, and I have no clearance to do that. Why and the background of this rearrangement, I cannot discuss in an open meeting. Because I'll be going deep into an operational issue. Are you, I am not are, allowed. Are, are you able to discuss in camera if you have clearance? You have the clearance to discuss in camera. If you provide this is the committee that oversights the issues of security. If you provide an in-camera proceeding, maybe I will discuss that. I will be able to explain the background to that. But, but I can't explain it in, a, in an open meeting like this, because now I'll be, I'll be moving into the realm of operational issues. And then and, and my colleagues here, the heads of the agencies, will not allow me to go into operational issues in an open meeting uh, uh, like this. Um, the, 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 it's clear. Let's just be very frank with each other, Mr. Chairman, honorable members. The deputy president's residence is not a state lodge. It is not a state house. The law is very clear. It's black and white. It's a residence. It's a residence of the deputy president. It's not a state lodge. It's not a, it's not a, a state house. You know, there are some things which look or sound politically sensible, but it, frankly, when you go by the law, they don't. How would you come up and use phrases such as are being used and, and so on? The framers of the Constitution, you are the legislators. Give me a law to work with on this basis. 
give me a law that designates the residence of the deputy president and makes it a state law. Then on the basis of that law, I will gazette it. The, the, the cassettement of state lodges is very clear. The law is clear. The record is there. You know the state lodges and state houses that are supposed to be protected by GSU. Mm. The, the residence of the deputy president is neither a state lodge nor a state house. Is this a mimi na vikiri yapo, Mr. Chairman? Nisawa. Just proceed with the rest. Yeah. So, so, so the, the question of the politics of, of the decision that we made. You know, we are public servants. We... we, we we are public servants, we work uh, in a manner that we know we are going to be accountable to the public through members of parliament, through a committee like this. When we take decisions, we, we don't wake up in the morning and look at the weather, look at this. We make a decision that we believe is right to make at a particular time. We know that there are certain times where some political practice comes with some sympathy addiction. You know, the sympathy addicts who look for sympathy over anything. And we have watched that sympathy addiction you around the country where you know people draw sympathy over everything you know and so on but you see let me ask you a question as people who expect these wonderful good people seated on my left here to provide security for you how would you operate in an environment where they wake up in the morning and check the political temperature the weather before they make decisions we believe in making right decisions and the decisions that are right and necessary will be made regardless of the time they are made and then, and, and, and I keep saying, we in the security sector, we don't do this work to be popular. We, we, we would rather be right than popular. We want to do what is good for the country, what is good for the officers that we have been given to look after. If I had an opportunity and explained to you and Mr. Chairman went into details about how this decision was reached uh, at, you will be very happy with us because you will know that we have made very serious considerations. And this Inspector General, this gentleman seated to my left here, is a very considerate and very responsible public servant. So, so to cast as passions and say, oh, you know, why was this done and so on, this is not a whimsical decision. It was a culmination. It was made after several considerations have been had. But as I said, I can't discuss those considerations in an open meeting unless, you know, you have an in-camera session at which I can discuss that and I, and I will share with you uh, to an extent about that. The question of responsibility of police officers. You know, Mr. Chairman, this gives me an opportunity to respond to something that everybody asks me all the time. When public officers, for example, when members of, uh, you know, government uh, go to court and they are charged, for example, with murder or with very serious crimes, why does the Inspector General withdraw police officers from them? They do that because you don't want to put officers in conflict. Because you cannot get officers and tell them uh, to go and commit a crime or to accompany you to commit a crime, as it were. I, I understand and I hear you, uh, honorable members, when you are saying uh, if we are breaking the law, we are breaking COVID regulations and we are in the company of police officers, what are we supposed to do? We all start, first of all, with the fundamental good faith in all of us. And as I said earlier, there must come a time in the positions that we hold when some of the actions we take are driven by our own moral positions. So if those leaders, some of them senior in society, feel that what they are doing is the correct thing, uh, of course, it's for the public to, to, to judge. But we have kept pushing our police officers. And I know, I am aware, because the Inspector General has told me, that he remains in constant communication with senior police officers in the command of those who guard such VIP officers to ensure that they also assist in ensuring that the law and order is maintained. We hope that this situation will improve. But I can hear the concern that the Honorable Members have and will continue to work uh, at it. Is there alone the number of deployment? There is no law. I'll be very happy if you enacted one. Maybe if you actually enacted one and said for every holder of an office, uh, you'd be entitled up to X. It would be very happy. I mean, we will all be very happy. And I'm sure that the gentleman to my left will be very happy because it will make the work much easier uh, as it were. But now, as it is, I, I give you this example, Mr. Chairman. If today, for example, the holder of that office uh, requested that uh, I have uh, a butchery in Rongai and I need the butchery to be guarded and you refused to guard the butchery, then the butchery was attacked tomorrow. I mean, if we are insulted now, look at how we are being excoriated for just a routine reorganization of security. Can you imagine what would happen to us if that happened? So when a request comes, we accede to it. 
and then, then, then we, we, we keep moving forward. And all these wonderful men in the police service are doing so in good faith. And, and the question here is then was, up to what extent will you keep on acceding to requests? Up, up to which number will you then stop? Because uh, uh, as much as you're answering the others, you, you will now open uh, this, this line for us to be able to ask for extra police officers or ex security officers for that matter. Well, uh, please enact a law. Let, let, I, think let's, I think let's end the debate there. If you enacted a law that brought about limits, that brought about, um, talked about numbers, uh, and then, then, then we can do all these things are better. Uh, to be very honest with you, because of one thing. Uh, you can notice how, in some cases, Mr. Chairman, to be very frank with you, we are, if we are not careful as a country, we are sinking to new laws. Where you would, where in this world, just tell me, Mr. Chairman, where in this world mm -hmm. would a holder of an office of chief of staff in a senior office like that write a letter and put it in social media before it even reaches the inspector general of police? Where? And then so on. You know, this issue has been characterized by some very juvenile activism, petty propagandism, and so on. And then the facts are lost in that process. And then we don't want, we, because we are respectful of the institutions that we work, we don't want to go that direction. And we are not going to respond to those kinds of antics. We will do the work that we have been asked to do. That's why you have noticed that there hasn't been any correspondence from any one of us, including our Inspector General of Police. Because there are some institutions, if you subject them to disrepute, you erode the institutional respectability of your country as it were, you end up vulgarizing the authority and legitimacy of those offices. Because the ideal situation is that if you are a chief of staff in an office like that and you have a challenge, you go to your charge. Your charge is the head of public service. You don't even write to him. You pick up the phone because you have an extension to him and you ask the head of public service for a cup of coffee and you discuss those things internally. This new wave where everything is written and sent to social media, this is a propaganda attitude. We have a responsibility, Mr. Chairman, and I want to undertake to you as a public servant. We have institutions, we inherited these institutions, and we have a duty to hand over institutions to the next generations that are intact with the respect that they deserve. The respectability of security sector institutions is not going to be vulgarized and dragged through the mud because of sympathy addiction and all that kind of thing. Thank you, sir. Right, okay. We, we will then take... Uh... Honorable.